I wanted to ask, because we always face, especially with this issue, we have people come and talk about great things that they are doing, and it's always, okay, how do we expand this? How do we replicate it? Especially with what you have done at Northwestern in Chicago area, is how do we replicate it? So what were some of the challenges that you faced in establishing and growing the Office of STEM Education, education Partnerships, and what lessons can be taken by other institutions who want to establish something similar? Thank you for that question. Um, the work that we do with our faculty and, and would be similarly done at other institutions is largely funded by NSF's broader impacts requirements. And while this is an incredibly uh, helpful uh, requirement and stream of funding, there really is never enough of those funds to go around. We're sort of living on the margins, uh, if you will. Um, and what I guess I would like to see is NIH and perhaps other STEM mission agencies adopting uh, similar requirements or similar funding streams to uh, broaden out that pool. Uh, my written testimony includes a number of recommendations for strengthening and expanding NSF's broader impacts work, but I would say that a key, that's a key source for other new offices like mine to get up and running and off the ground. Are there any other things the federal government could do? Obviously, Northwestern is in a unique position. It's in a uh, large uh, urban area. It's a private university. Um, are there things that maybe the federal government could do to help um, or any suggestions you would have for, for other schools who might be looking at, at doing this who may not be in that position Northwestern is in? Yeah, I feel very strongly that the federal government could play an important role in providing seed funding, for example, for offices like mine, especially at smaller institutions or rural institutions, uh, to help them kind of get jump started and off the ground. Um, another important role would be to support a national network of these offices uh, so that we could begin to support each other and share the best practices that, that we've developed uh, over time with these uh, smaller and newer offices. Um, in addition, this network could then serve as sort of a national distribution network for facilitating the broader dissemination of federally funded STEM resources that are developed at any of our institutions. Right. Thank you. So many other questions that uh, I can ask. I want to let me go to this. I know uh, Mr. Partovi, Chairman had asked uh, some questions, talked to you about what you had done with the uh, Hour of Code. I know in, there are about 830,000 students in the state of Illinois uh, who took part in the Hour of Code. Uh, you, you put up there, it's very stark how many jobs there will be and how few, um, how few students will be coming out of college for those, those jobs. Is this something that is, how do we make that better understood? It seems like at least when I was in college, maybe because I was an engineer, we was always looking, okay, where are the jobs supposed to be you know, in maybe directing, giving us a sense of where to go? Why is that not happening? Is it because of the lack of, of, of background in students just saying, I can't, that's not something I can do or not something I'm interested in? Why do you think that is that there isn't a response to this uh, job demand that we know that, that's out there and will continue to be out there? Thank you very much. This is a great question. In fact, one thing I, I have trouble getting people to realize is that, you know, we, there's a common thread that there's a crisis of not having enough STEM professionals in the country. If you look at the actual data, most STEM fields have too many graduates. Whether there's more math graduates than math jobs, there's m actually more engineering graduates than engineering jobs, more life sciences graduates than life sciences jobs, and then way more computer science jobs than computer science graduates. And if you look at student decisions, by the time they get to college, many students have decided their passion. And if they're in one of the 90 percent of schools that doesn't even teach computer science, they never had any background to think, I could do this. So the way to solve the problem isn't just building awareness. They know that, oh, if I could be the next Mark Zuckerberg, that's an amazing future. That already is the new American dream. The problem is they think, I can't do it because high school never exposed them to it. Okay. I see, I see my time's up. So thank everyone. For for their uh, testimony. To all of you, uh, your, your testimony has been, been extremely impressive. I, 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 sit, I sit here and I think 
that, um, well, now Mr. Massey's gone, I can say this, you probably put all of us, we all sitting up here probably look and say, if only I were that good when I was that age, I certainly would say that for, for myself, but uh, uh, obviously you all have great opportunities that, ahead of you uh, for, what, uh, for whatever you want to do. And I'm sure if there are any parents out there, teachers out there, you have to be extremely proud of, uh, of your, your child here. And I'm sure Mr. Kamen sitting there is, uh, has to be extremely proud. I, I taught, but I taught uh, college before I was elected to, uh, to Congress. But um, it, it's just very impressive what you've been able to do. And I just encourage you to, to, to keep that up. Obviously, you've put in a lot of hard work. Uh, Mr. Morris, you talked about the hours. How many hours do you spend? Did you spend on uh, on first? Um, first, the first season is structured a lot like a sports season. Um, so first of all, we have our off season, um, and so that is we're preparing for our season, um, and so that's. It's hard to kind of estimate how much, but I'd say at least three hours a week, at least. And sometimes there'll be big spates of work where we. We'll be out at an outreach event, or we'll be volunteering for you know eight to ten hours a day, um, and then we get to the build season, which is when we construct our bot, and that is at least on my team that is four to six hours every day after school, as well as eight hours on Saturday, and that increases um, that increases over the duration of the build, over the duration of the six weeks, and um, after the build, um, a few months later we go back, kind of back into preparation mode, and then we've got our competition, and competitions are three days of very intense 24-7 um, uh, work, basically. But also, they're a lot of fun. So that's just kind of a summary of the hours. Um, I don't know if some of these other teams work differently, but that's how my team works. Any, anyone else want to comment on Surachikanda? Yeah. Um, on average, I'd say probably I'd spend 10 hours a week on um, uh, first related activities on robotics club related activities and uh, the work never stops uh, you know they say um, you know like football never stops or whatever you're still working in the off season you're still working in the off season for first I mean uh, we have a team calendar the entire year every month we have to have something done you know June through June, June through August we have to manage that's when we really try and set up our plan for the next year that's when we want to get our corporate sponsorships that's ideally when we want to get everything rolling in because January to March we have to build our robot and trust me nothing else is happening until the robot's done so, you know, November through December, we have to train our new members, we have to teach them programming, teach them how to use the skills, safety, um, safety training needs to be done because we are working with power tools. So, um, yeah, there are a lot of different aspects to it, which I think is one of the most unique things about FRC. It's not just about the robot, but you really are running, you know, I like to call it the world's toughest corporation because all your talent has gone in four years, everyone's volunteer, and the people who are leading it are all volunteer. And so it, it's very unique, and that's what I think is... Um, very important about it. I guess my other students can also talk about that. You know. Anyone else want to? In the off season, uh, you definitely have lots more time to uh, go into the outreach aspect of FIRST, which is just as much a part of it as the build season is. Um, it's about helping other people, gracious professionalism. Uh, even during the build season, uh, we'll help with other teams. Uh, we take a few under our wing and sometimes help them get started. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a great experience, and it doesn't end at the end of build season, but it, it definitely picks back up. Is, is there anything that, uh, what can be done? Is there anything we could do, anything you could do, what, in terms of encouraging more students to, to get involved? And I want to start with Ms. Crew, because you, you obviously, are, you're coming at this, uh, we're talking about all this technical uh, you know, stuff about the robotics, and you were involved in a, in a different part of, uh, of FIRST. So is there anything that uh, can be done to encourage m more people, more kids to get involved? I think it definitely needs to be in more schools and it needs to be more, there needs to be more awareness about it. There's not nearly enough, you know, information on it. You know, at school they'll always do announcements about what your sports teams did and reminding you to come out to the game and all that and robotics is kind of a, it's like an accidental secret. Nobody really has heard of it unless you have you know somebody in it most of the time, or we do something really incredible and it is on the announcements. And um, so I think it definitely needs to be more. The word needs to be spread. 
Yeah, I don't think that's really the fault of the teams. Um, I think you've, you've heard people mention outreach a lot. Uh, spreading the message of FIRST is something that um, Dean is big on and the entire organization is big on. But um, like just trying to get access to the gym, to use our robot, to get like, um, not to demean the sports, sports team at all, but to have the same kind of um, formality with the school um, is certainly something that would help you, because we certainly think that this is just as important. Mr. Rachikanda, yeah. Sorry, just briefly. I think unknowingly or like whatever, it used to be that STEM and these kind of things were niche activities. They were just something that, you know, maybe in the 70s people would build train tracks, but that's not what it is anymore. Uh, you know, the sample model train, train tracks. But now it, it, it has become an athletic activity, at least in the model of FRC. We have 50 students on our team. That's not your usual club. We run a budget of $25,000. That's not your usual club. And so that's where I think that if there was more awareness in terms of how to deal with these kind of STEM activities and recognizing this is not just another academic activity. This is not just Quiz Bowl, which I'm also a participant in, and it's great, but <laughs> it's not just Quiz Bowl. It is something different, and we need to recognize that in how we treat it. And you know, Mr. Pavodi was talking about how we treat computer science and everything, but in terms of activities, too, we need to realize that, that it's quite different. Thank you very much. Thank you.